I think that there is evidence that the nervous system is aberrant in patients with this illness. Um, and certainly some of the work of Alan Light and Kathy Light at University of Utah um, has suggested that when one puts individuals um, on some type of exercise submaximal challenge, um, one does see some of these types of genetic markers. Um, so yes, I do think that there are kind of, kind of nervous system kind of domains that patients can um, you know, have significant problems in. Um, and I think that they directly are implicated um, in this particular illness. I think that for most patients, um, what we see is kind of a sympathetic dominance um, over the parasympathetic system. In a sense, their body is kind of, in a sense, tuned up. We often kind of see the symptom of called wired. And that's actually a very common description of patients. They're exhausted, but they're still wired. So in a sense, their system is upregulated. And I think everything that we can do to help patients downregulate that system is actually healthy. And, and it's very interesting that lots of the pharmacological types of things that people sometimes try, um, including clonopin and, and other things like that, um, seem to begin to help downregulate that system. So yes, I do think that there is uh, an upregulated system in many patients. Many patients with ME often have kind of a supply of blood that is just kind of lower than healthy normals. Um, and what happens when they do a challenge to their body, which is called orthostatic stress, when they stand up, um, they often don't have enough blood to get to their brain. Um, and individuals sometimes feel faint and they don't feel well. So that's because, in a sense, they're not getting enough blood from you know, their bodies up to their brain when they stand up. So yes, there does seem to be some major circulatory issues um, among patients, and, and orthostatic intolerance is one manifestation of that. Post-exertional malaise can be measured by asking the right questions um, on self-report questionnaires, and also by using exercise challenges, um, whether they're kind of by having people kind of exercise on bicycles for 10 or 11 minutes, um, or even up to 20 minutes in a submaximal challenge. So yes, I think it's important to kind of look at both what people say as well as what people do in the laboratory um, and to bring the best of those two together to understand this complex symptom called post-exertional malaise. Many patients begin to become symptomatic after some type of viral infection. So it does seem certainly in terms of the sometimes in some samples up to 70 percent of people um, report having some type of viral infection. Ultimately, the best way we're going to understand the role of these types of infections is longitudinal prospective studies. Um, an example is one that we're currently um, involved in in Chicago with Ben Katz. Um, who's at Children's and Northwestern. And we're going to be following thousands of college students who are healthy over time to see which ones develop mono and which ones recover and don't recover. And that's really the best way of us being able to identify whether a particular virus or any other types of things might be both involved in etiology as well as maintenance of an illness. Involving markers for ME, yeah, I think that um, we could say that um, we're beginning to identify some of them. And in the future, I think there'll be many others. Um, you know, certainly, you know, cortisol difficulties. Um, it seems like the people who have a lessened increase in cortisol in the morning um, might be a very good marker. Um, natural killer cell activity has been talked about in a number of review articles. Um, as well as, you know, there might be subgroups of individuals that have other types of um, markers. And I think that uh, the future will hopefully be able to discover many more of these and, and be able to get them across kind of laboratories. But again, 
if you're going to find markers, it's only going to be if you have the same types of patients in different settings. And that's why the case definition is so important. We have to identify the same people in different places if we're ever going to basically find consistent biological markers. The reason that's so important is if you don't find consistent biological markers, it's very easy for people to assume it's a psycho psychogenic, psycho psychiatric illness as opposed to a biological one. Heeft u een vraag naar aanleiding van deze video? Reageer op YouTube of tweet naar het MECVS Vereniging of mail naar wvp.me-cvsvereniging.nl. Uw vragen worden zoveel mogelijk behandeld in de chatsessies.